Good afternoon. Welcome to our annual meeting. Um, I'm Gilles Brunsburg, Executive Director and Secretary of the ANS. In ordinary times, the ANS Chairman would be presiding. However, due to coronavirus concerns, the ANS officers who are presenting this year will be doing so off-site via Zoom, with the exception of myself as Secretary of the Board. In attendance with me as well, are a group of fellows who agreed to be proxies for the purpose of voting on all business that comes before them, as well as several members of the ANS staff. As usual, the business of a meeting is thus being held on the premises. For the first time, however, this meeting is being made available to all the NS membership via live stream. This means that we can welcome a much larger number of our members to our 163rd annual meeting. I would like to first invite our chairman, Ken Edlow, to offer a few words. Ken, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Gio. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the American Numismatic Society's 163rd annual meeting. I'm the Kenneth Edlow, the chairman of the board of trustees. I joined the ANS back in 1972 and have been a trustee since 1993. Since retiring a few years ago, I've spent approximately the last eight years at the ANS's headquarters, wherein I functioned as a volunteer and I was able to use a lot of the skills that I acquired, both administrative and financial, during my 40 years uh, on Wall Street at Bear Stearns. I had the great pleasure and honor of interacting with the wonderful, talented staff of people at the ANS, be they curators or the administrative people with whom I mainly interacted. I'm so pleased to be able to welcome a much larger universe of our membership today in, in view of the fact that we have gone virtual. We have a very full program. So at this time, I'm, I would like to call the meeting to order and I will turn the meeting back over to Jill. Thank you, Ken. To continue with the program, we have fellows present and proxies received. A quorum has been established. Therefore, I officially call the meeting to order and ask of those fellows present, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of last year a new meeting of October 19, 2019. So moved. Will someone second the motion? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will now hand the meeting over to ANS President Sid Martin. Sid, it's your turn now. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd like to echo uh, some of the comments that have been made. Uh, this is a, 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 a real adventure for us to host um, uh, our annual meeting uh, under such a forum in this situation where the pandemic has us all uh, sort of second guessing. Um, as I was introduced, I am your president. Uh, I have been your president since eight years ago, basically today. This is my eighth uh, annual uh, meeting. Um, it is, however, uh, going to be my last annual meeting as president. Uh, I have elected to step down, it's time. Uh, and I, I think it's a, a, a good decision. Um, I, I do wanna reflect uh, on the last eight years to some extent. Um, I also wanna thank uh, those who've helped make the last eight years a real success. Uh, notably, um, I spent seven years working with uh, Udo Wartenberg uh, as executive director. 
and the final year with Gilles as the executive director, they have made my job easy. Uh, and then during my entire time, I've spent working with Ken as chairman, and that has been gratifying. Uh, now, we all know that, that our success is in large part uh, due to the, our staff. Uh, our staff has made uh, things flawless and, and work for us. They're incredibly dedicated, incredibly talented, and uh, loyal. I'd also like to, uh, to, to thank the members. Uh, our, our organization is nothing if it's not our, our member base. I'd like to uh, thank the fellows. Um, you've all handled your duties and responsibilities uh, at the highest level of uh, professionalism. Um, and, and finally, uh, during this entire time and before I actually became president, uh, I've enjoyed working with our, our incredibly talented board of directors. Um, they have, to a man and woman, uh, taken a, a great deal of uh, joy and, and uh, guiding this organization to where it is today. And finally, I thank my wife for putting up with me when we all talk about these little round things. And uh, she's uh, been very good in that regard. I do have one less than joyous thing to, to talk about. Uh, our membership, most of our membership will recall uh, Joel Anderson. Joel has been a, a long-term member of the ANS. He has been on our board. Um, since I think it's 2006, uh, he has is incredibly generous to the organization. The, the conference room is, is named for he and his brother, Charles. Um, they are well known for names like Whitman Publishing uh, and, and so on. Anyway, Joel uh, did pass away on October 12th, will be sorely missed. And um, I just wanted to, to thank him posthumously for his time and effort on behalf of the ANS. All right, so major accomplishments in the last eight years. Uh, th these are things I'm very proud of for the most part. Um, and I would like you to share them with me. First, our endowment is done extraordinarily well in part because of the market, but in part because we've been very careful in, in our stewardship of those endowment funds. Um, we are now, and you will hear more about this when our treasurer speaks to you uh, following my uh, discussion. Um, we, we have established some chairs that we're working to get endowed. Uh, one is the medieval and modern European chair and things are going well. Uh, the other is the chair of the executive director and I'm a little disappointed in that. Uh, we started that chair, uh, collecting for that chair about maybe four years ago. Uh, our goal was to raise $4 million to endow that chair. At this point, we stand at just a little less than half of that amount we've been able to raise. Uh, I hope that we can correct that and uh, look forward to when that is actually accomplished. Um, one, one sort of, tragedy, or at least we thought it was going to be a tragedy, was when we lost uh, the medals and, 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 and coins from the Hispanic Society that had been on loan to the ANS for a long time. Uh, now, as luck would have it, uh, we have recovered and brought back into our collection uh, some 15,000 of those 18,000 coins, and that has been due in large part to the generosity of, of Ken Edlow. Uh, Ken, I, I personally thank you for that, and I know uh, everyone uh, who's listening to this will as well. Uh, an incredible thing has happened, and it's actually um, accelerated during this time of, of uh, COVID, is, is our digitization. Um, we have at this point uh, somewhat in excess of 100,000 coins that have been photographed and entered into our databases. We, we've got very robust databases that are now being used by throughout the world. Uh, examples of those include Ochre, which is the online coins of the Roman Empire, uh, coins of the Roman Republic online, and, and so on. Uh, these, these databases are proving to be incredibly useful. 
Um, and we've made great strides in digitizing our library and archives, in part because of our, our partnership with the Newman, Newman Numismatic Portal, who, who has actually supported us uh, financially and by lending us people to, to accomplish this digitization. That has allowed us a digital outreach that we've never had before. Um, we, we introduced a series of um, digitized or digital based uh, things that, that allow our members throughout the world to, to participate um, more heavily in our ongoing activities based, based in Washington or England or we have on YouTube right now, do you know? Wherever. Uh, I, I'm talking things like uh, the long table talks we're having now, the money talks, the pocket change blog, the planchet, all okay. these kinds of things are, are available they, they to, to, our, to our, uh, our, our membership at large. And that is, that is going to allow us to um, attract membership from, from a larger base than what we've typically uh, been able to do. We've continued our string of, of incredibly good uh, publications. Uh, we, we, we've produced winning books. We, we've gotten NLG awards for our publications. Uh, we've got new publications that we've started to attract um, a, a wider audience. I, I'm thinking of things like Gene, which is a journal of early American numismatics. Um, we, we've extended our, our um, our presence at major coin shows throughout the, 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 the country. Uh, we've continued to have uh, a strong academic production in, in terms of uh, uh, teaching uh, the, the books, as I've mentioned, lectures, conferences, and, and things of that sort. One of the things that I'm really proud of is the fact that the ANS acquired and is processing the, the MAKO um, archives and, and, and files and dies and coins and tokens. That's the Medallic Art Company. When they went uh, bankrupt, uh, we were um, in a position to be able to, to acquire all their assets, or at least, I'm sorry, most of their assets. And in doing so, we have done an, a, a really tremendous thing for the numismatic community. We preserved basically our 20th century uh, medallic history. Uh, had we not done so, it may have ended up in hands that have been uh, everything from doing restrikes to, to, to whatever. But we are now processing that. Uh, that material is being integrated into our collections. Uh, some of the material that's superfluous or duplicative uh, will help finance us as we move forward into the future. Uh, and, and another thing that, that I think has been very important is our board over the last two or three years has come to recognize that we're probably not going to be able to maintain the kind of current facilities that we have. Uh, they're, they're, they're extraordinarily expensive. Uh, we've begun looking at what happens when our lease runs out in uh, about five years, six, six years. Um, and I think that just recognizing that we've got to start planning now. Oddly enough, this COVID-19 has shaped some of our thinking as to what our actual requirements might be in the future. Um, and then I think one thing that's been really gratifying has been the response of the ANS to the, to the COVID pandemic. We have been able to exist through this. Uh, Gilles has taken the necessary steps. The staff has supported them in that, <coughs> excuse me. And we are actually emerging from, well, not, we're not emerging from it yet, but it looks like we're going to be able to emerge even stronger than, than when we entered into it. Going back to the fact that I am stepping down, uh, my replacement will be chosen by the board, uh, <coughs> excuse me, over the course of the next week. 
And I think that uh, your new president will be able to continue to guide uh, the institution and, and continue it into the future in a, just, a, just an incredibly viable, uh, viable way. Again, I'd like to thank you for a, 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 a great eight years. Uh, you know, I'm not just going to disappear into the night, but uh, it is time for me to pass the baton. And now I'd like to introduce our treasurer, Jonathan Kagan. Can you hear me now? Yep. Uh, when I think back to uh, last March and what it would, I was expecting to say at a meeting like this, uh, it's fortunately you know, quite different than, uh, than what it, it looked like. Uh, in March, when the market was down 30% and where the sense that there would be uh, kind of no hope for contributions, things were looking very bleak. Fortunately, we've been able to participate in the market recovery and in the end have really had an extraordinary year from an investment uh, performance. Uh, at the end of this fiscal year, at, at September 30th, the ANS had uh, uh, investable assets of 47.4 million up from 43.1 million a year ago. The total investment returns were $6.8 million and we uh, made a return on our endowment of 15.8%. That's, that's not a normal number. Uh, you know, the, uh, the market last few years has been averaging about a 7% return. The S&P 500 last year, our last fiscal year was up 4.25%. Um, we had a combination of, of, of uh, of uh, having the wind behind our back in the last couple of months, but we also made some decisions that, that actually worked out very well. Our benchmark was probably on the order up 10%, so we outperformed it by 600 basis points, which is, is a big number in the investment world. If there was one thing that we did right, and you know, these small decisions can sometimes matter, it was tilting towards growth rather than value, and, and especially on the international front. We had one fund that was up uh, 49%. Uh, so as good as this is, unfortunately, you know, <laughs> one cannot predict one can do this going forward. Um, but at least as of today, uh, uh, our endowment is, a, is, is in a healthy position. The, uh, we were also able to operate uh, on budget. Uh, there were things that COVID cost us in terms of IT spending as people could work from home but it also saved us some money uh, in terms of uh, guard services and others. And uh, we uh, essentially came in as we were expecting. And then on top of that, we, we, we have benefited from a, a PPP loan of $330,000 that based on our calculations uh, should all be forgiven uh, once we apply in the next few weeks. Um, so all in all, it was fiscally a good year but it just reminds us uh, that uh, um, the challenges ahead. Sid has, amount, has already mentioned the fact that we are looking at, at higher occupancy costs and greater taxes in New York. Uh, there is uh, the additional problem of, uh, of what uh, the market will do going forward, because again, we're not going to see these numbers all the time. And, uh, we're not going to have our gala this year on a traditional basis, which has been a source of a couple hundred thousand dollars in recent years of, uh, of contribution to our, our, our bottom line. So it's going to be a challenge and contributions will remain uh, uh, not only equally, probably more important over the next, uh, next uh, couple of years. And uh, we've been heartened by the very good response we received to our mid-year appeal. And so my fear back in March that uh, contributions would dry up completely has, been, has not been uh, has not come to fruit and fruition, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, uh, we enter the fiscal year with a uh, uh, with a budget that sustains our activities and uh, and is one that hopefully we can meet. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and now, on behalf of David Hendin, chair of the NS Nominating and Governance Committee, we are following this with all of you on live stream, I will conduct the election of a trustees. The nominating and governance committee report was mailed by post to the fellows of the society, our voting membership, during the months of August, and was posted as well on the NS website. 
Copies of it are available for the fellows in attendance. There are a maximum of 225 fellows of a society, including life fellows and honorary life fellows. As of this afternoon, we have 224 fellows. I'm pleased to report that pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of the bylaws, three associate members were elected as fellows of a society at this morning regular meeting of a board of trustees. And they are Mr. Wayne Kimber from Hollister, California, Ms. Shanna Smith from Oak Park, Illinois, Mr. Dave Stein from Roberts, Wisconsin. And pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of the bylaws, the trustees also elected Dr. Cécile Morrison of Devalier, France, Mr. Richard Schaeffer from Marbeth, Pennsylvania, as honorary life fellows. Congratulations to you all, and we look forward to your continued participation and support as fellows of a society. We now will proceed with the business of the election of trustees. Fellows of a society are entitled to vote at this meeting. As per Article 4, Section 6 of the bylaws, 20 fellows present in person or by proxy shall constitute a, a quorum. All fellows present were asked to sign in. For those fellows present, if you have not yet signed in, please sign in. Anyone, is holding, anyone who is holding proxies, please present them now. May I have someone present, but not a fellow of a society, volunteer to count the proxies? While the proxies are being counted, let me tell you the names of the following 10 trustees candidates who have been nominated for election or re-election for the term ending in 2023. I believe most of the trustee candidates are joining us this afternoon via Zoom or observing on the live stream channel. Ms. Carol Anne Menzi Collier from Amsterdam, Netherlands. Ms. Bess Deicher from Sylvania, Ohio. Mr. Daniel Hamelberg from Champaign, Illinois. Professor Sebastian Heath from Brooklyn, New York. Mr. John Nebel from Boulder, Colorado. Mr. Robert Ronus from Los Angeles, California. Dr. Christopher J. Solman from Paradise Valley, Arizona. And Dr. Ute Wattenberg from New York, New York. Would a fellow second the nominations? Thank you. Will those fellows present who have not mailed in or handed in their proxy earlier please raise their hands in approval of these nominations? Joan, please count the raised hands. Do we have a count of the raised hands and do we have the proxy count to report the outcome of the elections? Four raised hands, 92 proxies, Thank you very much. The trustees have been elected. Congratulations to the trustees of a class of 2023. I look forward to working with you and the entire board of trustees as we continue to advance the mission of a society. And now I would like to introduce ANS fellow, Victor England, who would like to say a few words. Victor, your turn. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Gilles. Like many of you present today, I have been a member of the ANS for many years. I am honored to be a fellow of the society. I want to extend my congratulations along with those of the board to members who have been elected as today as fellows of the society. 
all of us want to congratulate and thank the ANS as they have undertaken and accomplished an amazing shift of focus into the virtual world during the last year amidst concerns and restrictions from COVID. Our field is alive and healthy as we all find our own escapes in the world of numismatics. I have enjoyed many an afternoon, Friday afternoon, listening to a broad range of topics that have been presented live via Zoom at the long table events. If you haven't had the opportunity, consider joining us for a future meeting. I am here today to talk to you a bit about a relationship that I developed over the last decade as my wife, Kathy, and I got to know Sid Martin and his wife, Sharon. A number of years back, my wife and I were looking for a place down south to escape from the winters up north. I had spent much of my summers as a child in my mother's birthplace on the Golden Isles of Sea Island and St. Simons in Georgia. While doing some house hunting in Georgia, we ventured further south to Amelia Island, which is the southernmost island uh, in the Golden Isles chain and is in Florida. A chance conversation with Uda at the ANS about our house hunting revealed that our president, Sid Martin and his wife Sharon owned a home on Amelia. I had met Sid in passing a couple of times at shows prior to this and was aware of his collecting interests. At the time, I didn't think much, I didn't think that our interests in numismatics crossed that much. Time would prove me wrong. We met up with Sid and Sharon for dinner and by the next day had been introduced to their real estate agent. Long story short, a short time later, we purchased a place on Amelia Island. Over the years, our paths have crossed on various trips south. We have enjoyed many a long evening of dinner, drink and conversation with Sid and Sharon. I learned of Sid's absolute devotion to numismatics, his relentless pursuit of things that he has needed and have watched as he has brought to publication a number of excellent books. His most recent work on the St. Patrick coinage of Ireland also made me aware of his extensive collection of Irish gun money. Our numismatic interests had crossed. Knowing Sid, I have developed an appreciation for colonial American, and he, is, he has been introduced into the field of ancient numismatics. He's even bought a few along the way. Both of us are founding members of the Sage Society, and through our membership and our mutual love of travel, we have joined other members in a number of exciting trips that have taken us from England to Poland, Georgia, Italy, Turkey, Israel, Jordan, and more. All of us who are members of the Sage Society look forward to a time when we get back to enjoying our travels. Fellow Sage member Mary Lannan and I have been exploring ideas for a series of shorter Sage trips in the United States. Expect to hear more about this in the post COVID era. I personally want to thank Sid for his service as president since 2013. As we heard earlier today from Jonathan, uh, under, under his watchful eye and, the, and, and, and our accounting department, our endowment has steadily grown from, I believe, around $37 million when Sid took over to a healthy $40, $45 million today. He has successfully overseen the ANS's transition to our brand, for our brand new director, Gilles Bromborg, and he has helped lay the foundations for future growth. Challenges lay ahead for the ANS and for our next president of the board. Again, thank you for your leadership, Sid, uh, these last few years. And now I hand it back to Gilles uh, for his report as our executive director. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. It's now my turn to present the, my own um, report as um, executive director of the American Numismatic Society. So first of all, um, I'd like to stress that this uh, meeting is taking place uh, in a challenging environment, which has um, put us under structure. Especially from the technology policy. So the meeting today in itself is a technological challenge since we are having trails in person. Um, um, right right um, some staff are present. Um, we have speak, three more speakers that speak here. And at the same time, we are going to live stream. Um, the, sh the short film, a little bit of a while, 
and then uh, process some pre recorded presentation by the staff. And the whole thing is live stream uh, on YouTube. You know, the whole thing has been accomplished in house by our technology team, um, uh, IT manager, then Ida and Alain Koch, our photographer. In the slide that I'm, I'm going to use about the location, um, it's, it's a lot of text and a lot of great points. I'm not going to um, comment on each single of them because the staff um, is. Going to do a better job than uh, uh, going into uh, 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 I will just highlight uh, what seems at, at that point uh, the most strategic or the most not worthy. But in any case, we will send you next week the annual report where everything um, will be uh, reported in, uh, in detail. Um, our year. Um, is, you know, obviously um, uh, cut in um, several periods, the pre-COVID period, the lockdown period, and the, um, let's say, return to the industry uh, period. So the pre-COVID period would be, um, in a way, I won't say business as usual, because nothing is ever as usual as the NS, um, but we had a very nice start uh, well, fiscal year, uh, fiscal year October. Um, we had a very nice start, particularly with the gala in January. So, no, was the gala extremely successful? Well, um, I would say it was an emotional gala with a certain number of awards and the timing of the leader, our long term, uh, longest term, uh, standing on the lead. Um, also, achievement. Uh, needs to be, uh, you know, highlighted, um, and you know, particularly the hiring of this track uh, in order to expand the NS expertise uh, in the field of various events where we have no credit for a good while. Um, I'd like to mention as well the, that we hired Austin Andrews, who has been assisting Dr. Ruzo Wilder there with different research projects. Um, we had, you know, important receptions and lectures for the J. Sanford Saltus and the Archer M. Huntington Award, as well as several money talks. And progresses were um, you know, pursued in our digitization program, notably Orker and HRC. Um, I'd like to thank as well an anonymous donor who is a trustee uh, for helping improving our computer infrastructure. Um, at the same time, as Sid Martin, our president, um, was saying, we've been very present in the coin shows for how long as the coin shows could happen. Um, working on the Dick Schaeffer Roman Republican Die project, we had several schools visiting us. Um, and as you know, there was um, uh, a transition between uh, Ute Wartenberg and myself. And I want to thank her for having been very present and helping me uh, all that time, um, you know, uh, taking the measure of the challenges that the job uh, brings. I'd like to share some visuals now. So our honoree 2020 gala, Rick Belson, uh, when he was a little bit younger, uh, as you can see on this picture, and now on real time in January 2020, was a recipient um, of the ANS uh, award uh, for being uh, honoree, um, honored during the 2020 gala. Um, I'd like to thank him as well for his generosity in helping the gala to be financially successful. Other visuals from the gala, um, you will see Gar uh, Garfield Miller during his uh, uh, retirement speech, uh, the, Anders the Anderson Award uh, given to our chief creator, Peter Van Alphen, and other you know, pics showing that it was a real fun evening. Uh, at that time, we could still 
have fun without masks. We didn't have to wear the things. We didn't know what would, what would happen next. Um, we had several ceremonies, as uh, um, I mentioned. So we, we organized a display of many of the medals uh, produced by the, um, uh, by the winners of a Celtus Medal Award that has been given by the ANS since 1919. Uh, our last year, our 2020 uh, winner was Mashiko, um, who gave um, a very nice lecture um, in the INS uh, premises. Um, as far as the Huntington Medal Award, Medal Award is concerned, uh, Professor um, Oz Tekin from Turkey was this year, um, uh, won this year award and delivered the Sylvia Mani Hunter uh, Memorial Lecture um, at the ANS as well. Other activities of VNS, um, Jesse Kraft at a coin show in Baltimore. No, sorry, I think it was New York, uh, the International in New York. Some school visits as well, um, where you can see um, our um, Roman curator, Dr. Lucia Carbone. So more staff activities, including having some fun in a bar, at, uh, you know, when uh, the weather and the pandemic restrictions see, still allowed, otherwise, working with coins, working with books, um, doing our digitization. The retirement of Garfield Miller um, get, you know, allowed us to do a little private ceremony um, at VNS, and you, you, you can see um, his, um, you know, his display on the ANS magazine that was printed um, at that time. So now the lockdown. Um, I mean, we, we speak from New York City. I know uh, many of you are not from New York City, but you must have been following how the COVID crisis unfolded in New York, which was probably the worst location on earth um, at that point in, in March and April. Uh, New York lost probably around 30,000 people. And I think to date is the major city that has uh, sustained the highest number of death uh, through this pandemic since January. Um, I must say that, um, I mean, we, without being genius, we saw it coming. Um, by the you know, mid months of February, when Italy was reporting all these deaths, um, and the virus was already present in the state of Washington in the US, uh, as well as France, uh, Germany, several Asian countries and Spain, um, there was no way the virus would not have spread more uh, widely in the US. Uh, seeing what was happening in Northern Italy, we were expecting by you know, mid-February that we would experience in New York the same type of situation. Maybe we thought it would not be that bad because we had time to prepare or the city had time to prepare, but effectu effectively it was worse. Um, as far as, as the NS was concerned, we, we had to prepare. And in order to prepare, we had, first of all, to dematerialize everything we're doing, all our financial transactions, you know, no more checks, no more uh, dealing with paper. At the same time, since the staff would be working from home, we had to make sure that everybody had the necessary equipment. So we acquired, you know, software and computers um, and again, I want to praise um, our IT manager, Ben Ibner, for um, managing and running that, that process uh, with a sense of urgency. We knew we had a few weeks uh, to be ready. Um, very importantly, the staff, including myself, we had to redefine what we could do. What are we going to do from home when the coins are here and the books are here, the banknotes are here, the medals are here? So our, um, we needed to come up with uh, targets that would be achievable uh, from home. We had to secure as well the site, the NS site. Uh, if we were to be away for a couple of months or three months, what would happen in case of a flood, a heat wave, or the other around? Um, we had to make sure that our security was enhanced so that we could watch our security cameras 
from home. Um, we knew as well that we would not be able to photograph any object for a while. So Alan Roche was under a lot of pressure to photograph as many coins as possible for the forthcoming magazine issue. So these are some visuals about the preparation for the lockdown. Um, you, know, you know, you see here David Hill and Ben Ibner covering the library and the books of the rare room uh, with, with plastic. Another visual shows the box where the mail would arrive during the lockdown. Uh, some of us came on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis to collect the mail and see there was nothing important we, went, we, we should not miss. And we had, you know, something which was extremely um, nice. Um, we received a lot of letters from our members, membership renewal, letter of support, donations. And uh, that was a warm feeling that even in these circumstances, um, our membership was there present with us. So during the lockdown, the main challenge was to, was to ensure our financial sustainability. Um, as mentioned by our treasurer, Jonathan Kagan, we managed to um, receive a significant amount of federal uh, help through the PPP Paycheck Protection Program. Um, this program went along with a commitment to keep our staff, which is something we had always wanted to do and which, which we achieved. If there is one thing we, we can be proud of as a, you know, as a corporation, um, it's that we didn't have to let anyone go or even to cut anyone's salary, uh, which is something that you know, in the months of March would not have been obvious. Um, at the same time, we received a very generous donation, a private grant, in order to fund the digitization of the NS European collection. So we call this the European project. So during that time, tens of thousands of records were cleaned or updated. Um, and we moved to our completion some of our digitized project, digitization project like Ocker with a new Adrian volume or Hellenistic royal coinage while we're processing different books. Um, at the same time, we had new members and renewals, which was, which was nice. We managed to print the magazine and we moved the money topes to a virtual format and as well initiated the long table series uh, thanks to um, our um, um, curator research um, member, Uta Wattenberg, during her transition being, you know, between being executive director and soon president. Um, we initiated as well, thanks to Andrew Reinhardt, um, the planchette, which is the podcast, and our blog was revitalized uh, during uh, this lockdown uh, period. And we started our media appeal, which was not, uh, which was very challenging. And I want to thank the uh, membership team, um, Eshel and Emma. So during the lockdowns, there were other uh, challenges that, you know, you will not see, but we had to run everything digitally, all our meetings, Slack, Zoom, um, work on our budget, on our audit, um, you know, run our strategic fellow survey with a 36% re response ratio. Uh, and more importantly, at the very end, um, to prepare for our return to, um, to Varick Street. So let me share some, some visuals for that period. So that's a staff meeting. Um, so everybody had to organize a home setup. Some people were lucky enough to have out, uh, outdoor space on Vizem because I was, um, I was locked in my uh, um, uh, cellar or basement uh, because of all the conf calls that were too noisy and my kids exiled me saying, okay, dad, you're too noisy. Go to the basement and stay there. So basically I had no idea what the weather were like outside, you know, throughout March and April. I would reemerge from time to time. So that's, that was a work from home period um, with home setup. Um, these are some uh, pictures of, uh, from our money talks um, during you know, the confinement period in New York City. Uh, we were pleased to see an increase with the attendance. A money talk at VNS would be about you know, 10 people, 12 people, because we were, we were limited by space. With the money talks and the long table, we reached an average of 30 to 50 uh, people in attendance. And at the same time, the geographic constraint has disappeared. If you live in California or in Italy, 
you can join and the time difference, we, we make sure that the time difference is not a major constraint. Uh, the Friday long table is 1 p.m. It's 7 p.m. in Europe, 6 p.m. in the UK, um, and um, 10 a.m. in California, if I'm not wrong. The planchette, so our uh, podcast, our new podcast series. And now, uh, all of this has reflected and translated into increases with our online footprint. So these charts, which come from Google Analytics in orange is last year fiscal year. So October, September in blue is, in blue is the, sorry, in blue is the last year that just ended and in orange is the year before. So 2018, 19. As you can see, the blue curve is almost invariably above the orange curve. Overall, we, we have witnessed about a 20% uh, rise with our online footprint on our various media and digitized resources. What's interesting as well, I mean, you've seen here a seasonal chart. As usual, there is a, a kind of dip in summertime, but the, the uh, increase with our um, uh, online traffic has maintained uh, irrespective of um, the lockdown. It's not because people were at home uh, or not at home, they would, they would spend more time with us or not. It's, um, it's um, probably something that will be sustainable. We are attracting more and more people online. At the same time, we have more followers with our various digital media platforms. So reopening Varic. I guess it was probably, um, as an executive director, the most uh, difficult decision to take. On the one hand, we are an institution um, with, dealing with mat material culture. It's difficult to work forever off-site. On the other hand, it's our responsibility to ensure our staff safety. Um, and at that time, you know, you know, we are in the months of May and June now, uh, most corporations announce they will not go back, or maybe spring 21 or summer 21. Could we afford not to go back? I, I was very influenced, you know, as far as I'm concerned, by a study that had been published by the French Institut Pasteur, uh, epidemiologist uh, institute of, you know, of, of, very, of worldwide reputation. And that study, what he was saying basically was that throughout the summer, we'll probably have a very, very low infection rate and it will be very safe. At the same time, they were forecasting a very significant second wave during the fall and winter. Basically, that's what's happening. The prediction are almost accurate, um, you know, when you look at their charts and what's happening now, it's extremely close. So I thought the summer would be an, a window of opportunity for us. We would come back. We wouldn't know for how long, but it would be safe and we'd be able, we would be able to achieve a lot during that time, no matter what happened next. So we reopened Varic as soon as we could. So these are some visuals uh, at that time. Uh, the security staff at Varic Street told us about a month ago, we were 50 in that building, including about 15, 16 from the NS. The building has an 8,000 employee capacity. It's telling you that, you know, we're working in a, in a kind of ghost building. At the same time, that means we are very safe. This is the architectural map of the ANS facilities. You know, like a year ago, people would tell us, oh, it's outdated. Everybody has a, his or her own office. Why? You should have open space and so on. I mean, let me tell you that today we're very happy not to have many open spaces, which means that almost, well, actually every single ANS staff works from his or her own private uh, space right now, um, which means a lot in terms of safety. Maybe we have been a little bit too far as far as safety protocols are concerned, um, as you can see. But you know, better safe than sorry. So upon our return, the main priority was to photograph coins, uh, bring some of our project to completion or push them forward. Um, you know, we're going to um, update and renew our website. We had many meetings about it. We selected a third party vendor 
And, you know, don't take me wrong, coming back to VNS was not a return to the world of yesterday. Um, we could still not have visitors. So being here in person meant that our digital offer had to be stronger and enhanced. And um, we were capable of, thanks again to our technical team, um, bring a lot of, you know, with limited technological investment, bring very significant improvement with the format of our long table money talks and meetings um, by combining different cameras. Now we're able to offer a view of a speaker of the slides, as well as high resolution pictures um, of the coin. So before I show some visual that have been taken here since the month of July, um, there is one specific, sorry, specific achievement uh, I'd like to highlight. We're going to announce very soon a prize called the Collier Prize. Um, who and that prize will be awarded biannually to the best single or multi-authored book catalog or online digital work in the field of ancient numismatics. One of our incoming trustees, Caroline Collier, is funding that prize. And I think it's very important, especially in that time when so many scholars are out of work, um, that we're capable of coming to the help with this prize that hopefully will take place next year for the first time. So some visuals, as you can see, we wear a mask um, when we are in common space, but not when we are in private offices. So we have very strict security pro uh, protocols. The European 1500, 1700 AD digitization project under process uh, from Alan Roche working station or cave, I should say. It looks like a cave, Alan. <laughs> Moving forward, thanks to the generosity of one of our trustees under the supervision of Lucia Carbone and Liz Yarrow, who is a professor uh, at Brooklyn College. We are continuing the digitization um, of various archives in the library, uh, thanks to the generous help as well from the Newman portal. So some of our money talks and long table, I was talking about these high resolution images from COIN. For those who have been witnessing or following some of these talks, you know what I'm talking about, but here you have some on, on the slides. And more peaks from money talks and long tables. We keep publishing books, and soon we will offer some of them on an ebook version, thanks to Andrew Reinhardt, our head of Direct of Publication. And there has been as well significant progress on our research and uh, you know, academic uh, field with different you know, publications, articles, and interventions in remote um, colloquium or conchos. I'm pleased to say as well that for us, it has been a year of awards. Um, the Burnett Anderson Medal, awarded to our chief creator, Peter Van Alphen, at the 2020 gala, and this year at the ANA Virtual Gala uh, to Oliver Hoover, NS agent creator and member of the publication team. Um, Andrew Reinhardt is now Dr. Andrew Reinhardt. And finally, we're very honored that Dr. Peter Van Alphen is now a member of the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee by appointment by the uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Stephen Munchin. We received as well a range of awards at the last NLG, um, uh, at the last ANA by the NLG. As is our custom at this meeting, we take now a moment to recall members and notable, notable figures of our society who have passed away since our last meeting. Last spring, our former president and noted collector, Donald J. Patrick, passed away. Mr. Patrick served with distinction as president of the society from 1999 through 2007. Under his leadership, the society was transformed 
into the vibrant institution it is today. As it moved from its home on Audubon Terrace, first 250 William Street, and then to our current home at 75 Varick Street. Within the society, distinguished history, Mr. Patrick will be forever recalled as one of our great leaders and collectors. We mourn as well the passing of Lottie Salton, widow of Mark M. Salton, the generous donor to the society, and our long-term um, fellow, Jay Garst. I would ask for a minute of silence now in memory of our deceased members. Thank you. Thank you again now on a different um, topic, uh, gift, donations, and VNS as a grateful recipient of private philanthropy, recipient of your generosity as member, fellows, and trustees. Our most extraordinary gift, which we record the next year, as me, is part of a Lottie Salton bequest half a million dollars in support of a medieval and Renaissance chair. Overall and altogether, 279 members this year have given to VNS above their membership dues, which is about a quarter of our entire membership. Our mid-year appeal, which ended a few weeks ago, witnessed a threefold increase with the number of donors and a doubling of the amount collected. Again, there are no too small donations. We appreciate each single of them. And we are very appreciative of the rise with a number of small donations. When I'm saying small, it's not dismissive. We've, we very well know for, that for some people, giving 50 or $100 is an extremely large gift. And we are grateful. I will end with our challenges. Our main challenge, as our president Sid Martin was saying, and reinforced by the report by our treasurer, Raffin Kagan, is financial sustainability. Long term, we cannot afford the cost of leasing a large office space in New York City. So there would be some decisions to be taken in, in future. Um, and what I'm saying New York City, I mean, you know, in this neighborhood as well, we are in Soho. It's not the cheapest area. When we moved here 10 years ago, or in 2008, it was not what it is now. We rely heavily on endowment returns and donations. We're grateful to donations, but can we be grateful for stock market return? I don't know. It's very uncertain. Who knows where the market will be a year, two years, three years from now? That's not sustainable to rely on above long-term trend performances. We need to increase and improve our digital presence further and in a way monetize it better. It doesn't mean we will reduce membership privileges, but at the same time, when we think that there is a decline with our advertising um, income, while we have more and more people following us online, this is something we need to address here. At the same time, we need to maintain public access to our collection, no matter what happens with COVID or any further pandemic, it's our mission to make sure the public can see our coins and it's more challenging now than it was. 
we want to be able to support research, as highlighted by the forthcoming Collier Prize that will be distributed biannually. We want to remain a place of dialogue and fruitful exchanges of ideas among a diverse constituency, as exemplified by our recent long table um, with Dr. Uto Wattenberg and Peter Tompa on cultural property. Yes, we have members with different point of views, but we can discuss in a civil manner and improve. We want as well to foster a sense of shared community across our membership in a context where social distancing is threaten threatening our social fabric. I know so many people who have not been out of the house or condo since the month of March. So we want to be, we want to help here and allow, you know, social, social relationship and links to survive the constraints that are um, impending our capacity to interact in person. Last but not least, we are working on a strategic plan that will be presented to the NS Board of Trustees early in 2021, and that will outline our main strategic goals and uh, paths toward a sustainable ANS. I would like to conclude by thanking our many benefactors who for a century have helped sustain the society with their magnanimous gift and donations. The benefactors who all at the NS headquarters are honors whose donors whose cumulated, cumulated gift have exceeded half a million dollars. We are proud to display two additional plaques this year, bringing the number to 92. We want to say thank you for this transformative support. Now it's the ANS studio production turn. They've made a short film during the installation of these two new plaques last week. Please enjoy the film and the energetic soundtrack. Studio, your turn. It's now my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce um, the NS staff. We will continue the program with three recorded reports from our staff, beginning with Eshel Kreider, our Director of Development. Good afternoon. I'm pleased that we're able to stream our annual meeting this year. This is a special occasion. I welcome the opportunity to address so many of you today. The annual meeting is a chance for the staff and trustees to give an overview of the activities that your membership and contributions, financial and otherwise, help to support. You heard from some of the trustees and will soon hear reports from curatorial and other staff. In between is my turn as head of development to say thank you. Ours is a collaborative enterprise and you are our partners. All of us at the ANS want to thank you for helping to make this year another successful and fulfilling one. Given the particular challenges facing so many people and institutions today, we are especially grateful to all of you for your steadfast commitment to the ANS. Because of you, our contributions picture is quite encouraging. This year's total donations came to more than 1,460,000. And together with your annual membership dues, that number is over 1,590,000. Included in this total are significant large gifts and grants, as well as many smaller ones. Some have been targeted for specific projects and other go to general support. For example, we received a large six-figure donation from an anonymous donor to improve the cataloging and photography of our early modern European coins. Likewise, we received significant support for the endowment for the curator 
of medieval and Renaissance numismatics. We also received the final payment of a three-year grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Contributions come from many members and range in size from $10 to $250,000. Your generosity with your knowledge, your time, and your donations allow us to be ambitious in our reach this past and unforgettable year and to have faith that our aspiring project list for the coming year is well within our capabilities. I would like to take this time to recognize members of the Augustus B. Sage Society. This group donates at least 2,500 annually, and many give a great deal more. Knowing that this support is available each year helps the society plan ahead with confidence. In general, the ANS has three annual appeals, the year-end appeal, which goes out in November, the mid-year appeal, our spring fundraising drive, and the annual gala dinner, which takes place in January. Collectively, these appeals represent approximately a quarter of our yearly donations. For the gala last year, we were privileged to honor our former trustee and benefactor, Richard Belson, at a celebration at the Harvard Club in New York City. More than 180 friends came to help us thank Rick for his devotion and generosity. The gala is a festive event that brings together friends and colleagues from around the U.S. and the world for an evening of socializing and celebration, while it also raised funds for the society. This past year event brought in over $260,000 for the ANS. However, unlike last January, the upcoming gala will be held virtually. We hope this means that many more of you will be able to join us as we celebrate another productive year and honor posthumously philanthropists Lottie and Mark Salton. Tickets for this virtual event, scheduled for January 13th, will be very affordable, thus presenting an unprecedented opportunity for all of us in the ANS community to take part in this singular event. More information will be available soon. And for those of you who have thought about the long term, thank you for providing for the future of the society by naming the ANS in your will. This year, planned gifts included a bequest of $5,000 and another for $500,000. What they have in common is the thoughtfulness of the donors, desiring to leave something to the ANS that will impact future generations of numismatic enthusiasts. We are grateful to those of you who have told us that you have included the ANS in your estate plans. You have joined other like-minded benefactors who over the past century and a half have ensured the longevity of this institution. I'd like to end today by stressing the important role you play in maintaining the relevance and health of the society. Members sometimes wanna know what exactly their donation supports or whether a gift of $25 or $100 really makes a difference? The answer is quite simple. Collectively, your donations, regardless of their individual size, support almost everything we do. From specific projects like our online lectures, the library, our IT infrastructure, to keeping the lights on in our offices. A gift for $25, for example, pays for the photographing of one item into the collection. $50 covers an hour's worth of data cleanup in Mantis. $100 pays for the electric bill for one day. Donations are important, but of equal importance is your membership in the society. That is critical. As you know, despite the society's eminence in the field, the ANS is actually a relatively modest organization comprised of people who, like you, are devoted to the notion that the study of numismatics has vital importance to our knowledge of society, history, art, and culture. You are vital to our existence, to our purpose, and to our meaning. So again, thank you. Now, um, I wanted to thank Echelle for her report on development, and now introduce you to Emma Pratt, who is responsible for um, managing our membership. And I know she's watching us from home uh, and her, her um, presentation has been pre-recorded like for all the staff. So I welcome you virtually to the annual meeting. Uh, so Emma Pratt. 
Hello. This year, we simplified and personalized membership. We had five membership categories, now one. The $100 associate membership fee covers all the benefits. So among other things, you get the ANS magazine, 30% off all ANS publications, and access to weekly members-only virtual lectures and discussions. Members can then choose to add a subscription to the American Journal of Numismatics and or the Journal of Early American Numismatics. Incorporating Gene into membership was a request that I frequently got, so I'm glad we could make that change for you guys. Foreign associates and fellows also used to get the AJN automatically. Now they can choose to opt out or go for the Gene instead. Our two institutional membership categories, libraries and corporate associates, now get both the AJN and the Gene in 2020. For those who don't know, corporate associate membership is for businesses who, among other things, want to get free advertising in the ANS magazine. And the libraries are some of our oldest members. Fun fact, our oldest paid member is the Connecticut State Library, who has been a member since 1912. As some of you may notice, numismatics is a very male-dominated industry. So it is not surprising that ANS membership has been historically male. But this year we had an uptick in female membership. Until 2020, our institutional members actually outnumbered our female members, but not anymore. 20% of our new members are women. I want to believe this is a celebration of the 100th anniversary of American women getting the right to vote. We also got some very young members this year. When we were still able to see guests, we had a woman stop by with her daughter. And this girl was six years old and she loved coins so much she talked about them, she was out of breath, told me about her collection, how she cannot wait to have a gold coin, was completely mesmerized by the library. So the next day her mother signed her up for membership and emailed me to get her in touch with our American curator. But our youngest member was actually gifted a membership two days after he was born by one of our trustees. So I'm hoping to have a literal lifelong member there. <laughs> Another request I would get a lot is that our faraway members do not have enough access to the ANS. This year, Necessity pushed our hand to do something that I have wanted to do for our members for years, virtual content. We now have weekly discussions and one to two lectures per month. This gives some members their first opportunity to attend talks and get some face time with curators and each other. Our most well-attended money talks was hosted by Warren Estee in Oregon. And the most well-attended long table was hosted in conjunction with the British and Royal Numismatic Societies, hosted by Andrew Burnett in London. Neither of these talks would have been able to happen a year ago. Thank you for your support of the ANS. The year started off promisingly enough last fall when I went down to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania to conduct some research on the early historical societies of the United States. I was there to look at the records of the Numismatic and Antiquarian Society of Philadelphia, and part of my research was going to be used for a paper to be given at a conference in Germany, which unfortunately had to be canceled. Nevertheless, the research proved useful for other projects relating to numismatic groups in the 19th century. In the summer, for example, I gave a presentation for the Society's Money Talk series on the ANS's first 50 years, comparing it with the other groups founded at the same time. The early American numismatic societies were also the subject of an article I wrote for ANS Magazine, in which I made use of the Philadelphia records as well as those of the Boston Numismatic Society, which can be found online at the Newman Numismatic Portal. The American Numismatic Society was founded in 1858, and six years later the word archaeological was added to its name and mission. It had little success in this area, however, and reverted to its original name in 1907. This failed attempt to expand beyond numismatics became the topic of another article I wrote for the magazine. Another great outlet for presenting research and items of interest is the Society's Pocket Change blog, this, for example, is a post I did about Isaac Francis Wood, a prominent member of the ANS, Boston, and Philadelphia groups. I was also pleased to have the opportunity to talk about the library and archives in a forum outside of the ANS, when I was interviewed for the Numismatic Bibliomania Society's Bibliotalk podcast, where I discussed my background as a librarian and talked about the scope and ongoing work of the library. In March, as we began thinking about a possible shutdown due to COVID, we started making preparations in the library. We didn't know how often we would be able to check on the facilities in person, so we took the precaution of covering the stacks in the rare book room with plastic to protect it in the unlikely event of a water leak. Sensors and cameras allowed us to monitor temperature, humidity, and the presence of water from home. A great deal was accomplished remotely during the COVID interruption. Staff, including part-time cataloger James Woodstock, used scanned title pages, tables of contents copied in advance, and online resources to catalog new materials 
while also working through a backlog of articles, pamphlets, and other items. In addition to the ongoing work of the library, the cataloging, book ordering, researching, writing, and other activities, I use this time to undertake a special project. Working with the administrators of the ANS's library catalog, Donum, I processed numerous spreadsheets of data to improve, update, and otherwise clean up over 10,000 records in the database, vastly improving search capabilities in the areas of language, year, and place of publication. But there is no substitute for working with the ANS's extraordinary collections directly, so I was thrilled to be able to return in June, remove the plastic, and get back to work on site. Plenty of work had piled up in my absence, and with the unfortunate exception of this plant, the library emerged from the shutdown unscathed. One project that has gotten back up to speed is the scanning operation that's been sponsored at the ANS by the Newman Numismatic Portal since 2015. Scanning technician Lara Jacobs has been back for a while, and there are now nearly 10,000 items from the library's collections available online, including auction catalogs, rare books, and archival materials. Work is now being completed on the correspondence of the Chapman coin dealership firm. These letters from over 2,500 correspondents and now filling 22 large boxes have been thoroughly rehoused and scanned, making them easily accessible online to everyone. A significant number of interesting and revealing Chapman family letters were discovered during the early part of this project, including many relating to the Chapman's father and his grain business. I used these and others to prepare another article for the ANS magazine. We accomplished the twin goals of alleviating space problems and raising money for the library when materials that had been boxed up to be sold as duplicates years ago were repackaged and sent to be auctioned by Colby and Fanning. This year, the sale of some of those materials brought in nearly $4,000 for the library. One important addition this year was the personal archives of numismatic bookseller George Colby, which was acquired and given to the ANS by anonymous donors on behalf of the Numismatic Bibliomania Society. It is filled with photographs, letters, and other items documenting Colby's relationships with great numismatic names like Harry Bass, Armin Champa, and ANS librarian Frank Campbell. And it formed the basis of another article I wrote for the magazine. A bound set of Colby catalogs was acquired and donated to the library by Dan Hamelberg. Over 150 or so catalogs in all, this was George's own complete set, covering the years 1976 through 2018. The later ones from his partnership with David Fanning, which began in 2010. We also received from the Colby Library this hard-to-find set of reference books, donated by Len Augsburger. Another significant addition to the archives this year were some notebooks on Connecticut coppers compiled by early American coin expert and ANS fellow Robert Martin, who passed away in 2017. These were acquired through the generosity of ANS members Sid Martin, Roger Saboni, and Tony Terranova. Scans of the notebooks are available through the Newman portal. We were also pleased to receive a number of other gifts, including Chinese books and magazines from David Chen Yu Zhang, early price lists and other materials from the library of Gordon Frost, given by his wife, Rosalie, books from the Token and Metal Society, early auction catalogs and price lists from Bill Bird and David Fanning, Russian books from Valentin Zeparedza, and numerous books, catalogs, and periodicals from Norman Pepin. We continue to help our members and other researchers remotely, but this is what I miss most of all during this time. Our visitors, like this group, Chris Baycraft, Andrew McCabe, Scott Roddinghouse, and Michael Davis, here using the ANS Photofile, a massive card research tool started in the 1910s. And we also miss our interns and volunteers, in the fall, we had the assistance of two Pratt School of Information students who helped us with cataloging and other projects, Hilary Wong and Nicole Bueller. Library school student Jared Goldfarb continued to help out with various projects. And a significant library project was brought to completion by one of our longstanding volunteers, Harriet Williams. This was the processing of a collection of counterfeiting and banknote reporting materials given by Michael Sullivan in two separate donations. We also welcomed a new volunteer to our library team, ANS member Avi Ram Cohen, who brings with him 20 years of experience working in museums, galleries, and libraries. We look forward to a time when these and other valued contributors can return to the ANS. And finally, I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the library in the past year. Thank you all very much. The Society published a record seven monographs during fiscal year 2019-2020, with four books currently in production. The eight books published in the past fiscal year are White Gold, Studies in Early Electrum Coinage, edited by Peter Van Alphen and Udo Wartenberg, with Wolfgang Fischer-Bossert, Heim Gittler, Corey Konuk, and Catherine C. Lorber. 
Hidden Power, Late Cystophoric Production and the Organization of Provincia Asia, 128 to 89 BC by Lucia Carbone. Old Regime France and its Jetons, Pointillist History and Numismatics by James E. McClellan III. The Tiflis Dirams of Manga Khan by Kirk Bennett. The Nablus 1968 Horde, a study of monetary circulation in the late 4th and early 3rd centuries BCE, Southern Levant by Heim Gittler and Oren Tal. Connections, Communities, and Coinage, The System of Coin Production in Southern Asia Minor, AD 218 to 276 by George Watson. Jacques Wiener's Most Remarkable Edifices of Europe, The Man, Monuments, and Medals by Michael Ross. We also did a few periodicals this past fiscal year. First of all, Volume 31 of the American Journal of Numismatics was published, and Volume 32 is currently in production. Articles in Volume 31 ranged from a numerical interpretation of the monograms of the coins of Aspendos to the distribution and circulation of the Victoriatus in northern Italy to Samarkand cast coinage. The Journal of Early American Numismatics saw two issues published, for a total of 418 pages, containing 10 articles ranging from colonial paper money of Spanish New Orleans to collecting American colonial coins in 18th century England. Four issues of the ANS magazine were also published, including articles on early numismatic societies, the numismatics of copper in pre-colonial Africa, French medallic artist Raymond Gerard, and coins and currency in the works of H.P. Lovecraft. The magazine continued to run regular columns from the ANS archives and new additions to the permanent collection. ANS members continued to receive access to the online editions of each issue to the magazine, which contained links to items in the Mantis database, as well as full-size images, pop-up notes, and more. The ANS won five, five Literary Guild Awards. Uh, best Book on Ancient or Medieval Coins pre-1500 went to White Gold. Best Book on Tokens and Metals, Jacques Wiener's Most Remarkable Edifices of Europe. The Best Feature Article on Early American Coins was The Authentic Fujio Restrike Dies by Chris McDowell and Julia Casey for the Journal of Early American Numismatics. And this all article also won the James L. Miller Award for Article of the Year. Best Feature Article on Numismatic History or Personalities also went to uh, John J. Ford, A Life in Three Portraits by Q. David Bowers for Gene. We had a, a couple of other bits of digital social media that we uh, put together for you. Uh, we have Pocket Change and we have the Planchet. And the ANS staff have rededicated themselves to the Pocket Change blog, which is published every Tuesday on numismatic items from the collection. The past year saw 45 new topics posted online. The ANS also launched a podcast this year, the Planchet, featuring conversations with notable numismatists. Early episodes include a brief history of women coin collectors with Mary Lannan, early electrum coinage with Peter Van Alphen and Uta Wartenberg, the coinage of Mark Antony with Lucia Carbone and Katie Capello, and foreign currency in America before the Coinage Act of 1857 with Jesse Kraft. Episodes are about an hour long and are free to listen to via numismatics.org slash Planchet or wherever you get your podcasts, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Now, publishing is a team sport, and I would like to express my thanks to the ANS staff, its phalanx of freelancers and peer reviewers, and of course, our readers and sponsors. Thank you. As has been the norm in recent years, the curatorial team again spent a great deal of time building and fine-tuning a number of sophisticated online digital resources this last year. Since the staff was working from home in the spring, the curatorial team used that time to clean up nearly 100,000 records in Mantis, our online collections catalog. Users should see marked improvement all across Mantis in their searches as a result of these efforts, including records for ancient Greek and Roman coins, early modern European coins, and United States colonial and federal coins. Many of these records were previously all but unusable due to the amount of errors and inconsistencies in them. In April, phase one of the three-year National Endowment for the Humanities funded Hellenistic Royal Coinages project was completed by a team co-directed by myself and Ethan Gruber. We successfully finished all that we promised to the NEH and went the extra mile to include some extra bits, including the launch of Antigonid coins online, which was not part of our original bid. This year's additions and updates to HRC include the bronze coinage of Ptolemy 1 through 4, which was added to Ptolemaic coins online with data input by Gunnar Dumke. The gold and silver types of Philip II of Macedon were added to Pella. The new database coinhoards.org, based on the print publication Inventory of Greek Coin Hoards, was launched with greatly enhanced data input by Disnarda Pania Bell. 
Around 5,000 monograms were digitized by Mark Pizik, Oliver Hoover, and Lauren Tominelli for Pella, Ptolemaic Coins Online, Seleucid Coins Online, and Antigonid Coins Online. Each of these sites now has its own searchable and sortable monograms interface, which can filter monograms by the constituent Greek letters. We launched the HRC Umbrella site, which includes an umbrella collection of these monograms. Online Coins of the Roman Empire also received a major update this spring. Following the publication of Richard Abdi's new Roman Imperial Coinage volume on the coinage of Hadrian, we received permission from both Spink, the publisher, and Mr. Abdi to work this new typology into Ochre. Lauren Tominelli was able to complete the data entry and prepare the concordance between the old and new volumes, her work in part generously supported by Ochre users. These updates to Ochre were unveiled in May. In the meantime, I've also been working with Zachary Taylor, a recent graduate of Trinity University's Computer Science Program, to continue work on the Computer Aided Dice Study Project, which was initiated by curatorial associate Richard Ruchonki some years ago. Mr. Taylor, who began work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California this spring, has completely rewritten the CADS algorithm, which he unveiled in a Money Talks in May, and which can be viewed on the ANS's YouTube channel. Zach and I hope to have a publicly available version of CADS ready in the not so distant future. Sadly, because of the pandemic, we had to cancel the Eric P. Newman Summer Seminar this year, our famed two month long coin boot camp that has been held at the ANS since 1952. In lieu of the seminar, the curatorial staff took time during the summer to devise a new educational program in numismatics and monetary history that will be aimed at three levels of students separately grade school students, middle and high school students, and adult students. The program will include a series of booklets on the topics taught in the summer seminar, such as die studies and hoard studies, serving to introduce the methodologies and theories of numismatics to more advanced students. For the younger students, we plan ultimately to produce a series of videos along with curriculum material on a variety of monetary and numismatic topics. We hope that by the summer of 2021, the first of the booklets will be published as we continue to develop the materials for the younger students. Despite the pandemic, a couple of members of the curatorial team nevertheless managed to do some teaching this spring and summer, albeit remotely using video conferencing. Dr. Lucia Carboni taught a class on Roman Republican coinage at Hunter College, while I taught a week-long seminar on ancient Greek coinage to students attending Coach University's Monetary and Numismatic Summer School, usually held at the university's Ahmed Center in Antalya, Turkey. Since mid-March, the curatorial staff has been engaging with members through a number of enhanced interactive online forums. Nearly all of the curatorial staff have taken turns hosting our virtual money talks held monthly and our Friday afternoon long tables, covering a variety of topics from aspects of ancient and modern coinages to updates on our digital projects. At the same time, the curatorial staff has been making weekly contributions to the blog posts Pocket Change and NumaShare, as well as recording episodes of The Planchet, our new podcast with publications director Dr. Andrew Reinhardt. Never at a loss for words, the curatorial team has also been quite active publishing their research this year. The rest of the team will tell you about their publications individually, but I'm happy to report that in January, the long-awaited tome, White Gold, Studies in Early Electrum Coinage, edited by myself and Uta Vartenberg, was finally published. With contributions from 21 authors, including myself and Uta, White Gold offers many groundbreaking studies on the beginnings of coinage. Already the volume has been well received, winning a Numismatic Literary Guild Award earlier this year for Best Specialized Book on an Ancient Topic, something that all of us involved with the White Gold Project can take pride in. Finally, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the honor of being sworn in by U.S. Mint Director David Ryder to serve as the newest member of the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee, taking over the position on the committee held by ANS Curator Emeritus Robert Hogue. I'm very much looking forward to working with esteemed artists and my colleagues on the committee these next four years, helping to select designs for our nation's coinage. This bit of, bit of public service will no doubt prove to be immensely fascinating and perhaps even a little exciting. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This year we've been quite busy in the Roman department. 
Let me begin with education and outreach. Before the forced closure of our offices in March, I delivered a lecture on didactic of Latin in coins for the undergraduate students in classics at Dartmouth College. I also welcomed three high schools, introducing them to Roman coinage. After March, I delivered a virtual lecture on the uses of Latin on coins to the honors program for classics majors at Hunter College, CUNY. Moreover, I held one money talk three long tables, and wrote four blog posts for the ANS blog, Pocket Change. For what concerns publications, my first monograph, titled Hidden Power, Late Systophoric Production in the Provincia Asia, was published by ANS last May. This book seeks to develop a better understanding of Roman monetary policy in the province of Asia between its establishment in the 120s BC and the beginning of the Mithridatic Wars. I also published four articles with topics ranging from bronze standards in the triumvirate period to the quantification of some Sulan issues in the 80s BC, to the relationship between publicani and monetary production in the province of Asia in the course of the first century BC. I'm currently finalizing the manuscript for the catalog of the Richard B. Wichonke collection. The 4,000 coins included in this collection, mainly dated between 2nd and 1st century BC, provide the historical and numismatic prologue to the study of Roman provincial coinage. Most of the specimens are of great historical and numismatic value. Some of them are even unique, as they illustrate the gradual transition from distinct to compatible monetary systems in the Mediterranean basin. The collection thus offers a unique overview of the diverse ways in which the monetary systems of the Mediterranean basin responded to the Roman conquest in the 2nd and early 1st century BC and to the related necessity of interconnectivity. The catalog should be published next spring. An international four-day virtual conference organized in conjunction with the publication of the catalog of the collection will take place next March and feature contribution by the foremost scholars of the field. Confirmed keynote speakers will be Andrew Barnett, Michel Amandri, Pere Pauri Boulez, and François de Calatay. A volume of proceedings is expected to appear out of this conference. Lastly, I'm very excited to say that my ongoing collaboration with Columbia University Rare Books and Manuscripts Library and with some Columbia graduate students is leading to a book project titled Antiquities in the Classroom, the Oldcut Collection of Roman and Provincial Coins at Columbia University. This volume will present a complete catalog with plates of the 3,500 coins held by Columbia University, with a preface overviewing selected archival materials from the collection. Brill Publishing accepted to publish this book, pending peer review, in the series Columbia Studies in the Classical Tradition. Tulkis in Fundo, Professor Liviaro from CUNY and uh, Brooklyn College, and I are co directors of the Roman Republican Die Project, RRDP. The documentation source for this project is the Schaeffer Archive, which includes over 300,000 images of Roman Republican coinage, patiently collected by Richard Schaeffer in over 25 years and accurately catalogued according typologies and dyes. The first part of this project consisted of the digital preservation of Sheffer's archive. In this initial digitization phase, we aim to publish the binders and the clippings on the ANS archival platform, Archer, and link them to CRRO. All of these are now online and available to the academic community. The second phase of this project consists in the quantification of Sheffer's die count as recorded in these images. Eventually, the statistical data will be published and made accessible through CRRO. The final goal is allowing RRDP data to be integrated to CRRO and CHRR. The synergy of these three databases will provide users with an unprecedented amount of precise quantitative data for the period of time considered. This will entail substantial external funding that has already been partly provided, this project will represent a prototype for every other digital project seeking a quantification of the numismatic data. Thank you. For the past year, my primary focus has been on the Medallic Art Company, or Mako Archives Collection. 
I began by cataloging the medals, which are complete from 1907 to 1984, more than 8,600 pieces. For each of these, I've recorded their compositions, weights, diameters, and thicknesses, as well as taken note of their present locations. I've built a Mako Archives website, which will attract attention to any potential funding opportunities for the collection. We plan to apply for a National Endowment for the Humanities grant in the coming year to help speed this project along, and the website will serve as a visual aid for those unfamiliar with metals. As it now stands, the most notable aspect of the Mako website is the specimen catalog, which, for the first time, offers a glimpse at a near-complete collection of Mako metals and a point of reference for those who either collect them in earnest or happen to come across the occasional rogue metal. Additionally, the website includes small groups of images, as well as essays on the history of Mako, the production process, as well as metals more broadly. With the areas of the ANS collection that I'm responsible for, I've begun to identify duplicates with the goal of eventually begin to purge extra material that occupies valuable space in the vault. There are many coins, tokens, and medals that were still boxed in two by twos and unaccessioned. I've since isolated those into one place and have begun to match them against the standing collection. The ANS has hired a curatorial assistant to help with the pending disposal of these duplicates. While working from home during the pandemic, I was able to make significant progress on cleaning up records of United States federal coin in Germantis, the digital platform of the ANS collection. I primarily focused on half cents through dimes, as well as transportation tokens. I would like to give particular thanks to Ray Williams for initiating a project for the two of us to clean up the records related to pre-federal coinage. We successfully updated the copper coinage of New Jersey, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, Massachusetts silver coinage, and Fujio cents, as well as the colonial paper currency from each of the 13 colonies turned states and continental currency. This has allowed these key sections of the United States Department to become a very functional part of Mantis. I've written several articles throughout the year for both the ANS Magazine and the Journal for Early American Numismatics, Gene. For the ANS Magazine, these included an article on the history of exhibitions that featured the work of Victor David Brenner, the fearful history of germs on the face of coins, and an upcoming piece on the Stone Mountain Commemorative Half Dollar. For Gene, I wrote an article on the Philadelphia goldsmith Thomas Shields and the regulation of foreign gold coinage in the pre-federal United States, and I'm writing a piece on the robbery of the Eastern Treasury of New Jersey in 1768. Furthermore, I'm in the process of editing my doctoral dissertation into a book which focuses on the circulation of foreign coinage in the United States in the 18th and 19th centuries. Thank you. Good afternoon. During the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic altered the rhythm of every day for everyone. However, the NS continued to acquire interesting materials by purchases and through the donations of our members and friends. We would like to express our deep appreciation and acknowledge them all. I also want to highlight a number of notable gifts and purchases in particular. Ken Edlow, chairman of the NS Board of Trustees, continued to enrich our medieval department with another portion of important coins from the former Archer Huntington collection. His latest donation includes a group of Castilian Dinaris Novenas in the name of King Henry. The same gift also contained a group of coins of John I of Castile, including in one six real, Blancas and Navarras. The NS Greek department purchased a valuable Ionian electrum fraction from Eritrea of the second half of the sixth century from the famous collection of Matthew Curtis. We also purchased some interesting items from the William Stankup collection of Black Sea coins. From this sale, the NS acquired an extremely rare silver diobol of the 4th century BC from Panticapayam in the Sumerian Bosporus, previously in Samuel Pozzi collection. And also from this uh, sale, we acquired a group of Roman provincial bronzes from Heraclea Pontica in Bithynia, previously in the famous von Aulo collection. 
Through the generosity of longtime fellow Anthony Terranova, our medals department received an interesting bronze memorial medal of Louis Agassi, the world famous scholar in the study of natural sciences. This medal is a work of Fritz Ulysse Landry, famous Swiss medalist and sculptor. Society was fortunate to purchase a copper strike from the original dice of the Comité Americana medal to commemorate a courageous action of John Eager Howard at the Battle of Cowpens against the British. This medal was engraved by Pierre Duvivier and produced at the Paris Mint. Because the dies for this medal were kept in Paris, the United States Mint was not able to strike additional medals for sale from the original dies. This example, which we bought, of the original strike of Howard's medals fill, fills an important gap in the society notable collection of the Comité Americana series. NS member Jai Chandra Sikhar generously donated a group of French medals and jetons of the 19th century that were lacking in the collection. Another group of jetons issued for the French Chamber of Commerce came from longtime member and NS fellow Ira Rizek. Dr. Rizek also donated an unusual bronze art medal designed by famed Finnish medalist Kauka Rassanen, who was awarded the NS Saltos Medal in 1986. The Society fellow Robert Sheff donated a unifaced bronze plaques of Pablo Sarasate, a Spanish violin virtuoso, along with a 1902 uniface portrait plaque of renowned Hungarian German violinist Joseph Joachim. Both of these enigmatic portrait medals are the work of Franz Kunitsky, a prominent Austrian sculptor and medalist. And as fellow Scott Miller and Miss Rosalind Miller's most recent donation included a plaster bus relief from around 1900-1915, showing a female head in profile by Louis St. Gardens, a famous American sculptor who also was the brother of a significant Augusta St. Gardens. Other items in the Miller's gift is a 1987 cast medal Fire and Ice by Eugene Dubb, a major contemporary American sculptor, medalist, and recipient of the NS Saltos Award. We also receive a group of three bronze uniface plaques portraying West Highland Terriers, designed by John Alfred Cook, a Pennsylvania sculptor and professor of Pennsylvania University. He also was awarded the Society's Saltos Medal. NS member and benefactor Adrian Caldiron generously contributed a notable gift of medals dedicated to the European history of the First and Second World Wars, and also medals with images of architectural masterpieces and influential political leaders, artists, and cultural figures. Honor and Life fellow Alan Helms enrich the NS collection of African tribal currency with a number of new remarkable items. Among them are sub-Saharan copper alloy anklets, a bronze color from Republic of Central Africa, a copper bracelet used as currency as well as jewelry, and an iron uh, item in form of snake from Burkina Faso. An important donation to our collection of modern European coins came from NS trustee Mary Lennon. It's a commemorative silver-proof 50 pence issued by the Royal Mint to mark the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union, commonly known as Brexit. 
which officially took place in January 2020. Mary Lennon also donated to our U.S. collection the wonderful set of 2020 Women's Suffrage Centennial Proof Silver and Medal. The NS uh, specially commissioned a medal from Joe Duarte, the winner of the Society's Saltos Award in 2011, in appreciation of the of Dr. Ute Wurtenberg-Kagan's two decades of exceptional leadership of the society. A second example ordered by society became an excellent addition to our collection of contemporary medals. The society is a principal lender of numismatic objects to museum exhibition around the country and abroad. This year, many local organizations around the United States are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Among them is a Westport Library in Connecticut, which in February opened the exhibit Westport Suffragists, Our Neighbors, Our Crusaders. This uh, show focuses on the local suffragists who help change the course of history for American women of all succeeding generation. Among the fascinating objects in this exhibit is a medal from the NS that was designed by Laura Garden Fraser, sculptor, suffragist, and vesporter. It's a bronze example of the Better Babies Medal awarded to the Women Home Companion Magazine. The NS loan on view at the Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles has been extended through June 2025. This loan included extremely rare and unique coins and a gold medallion from the NS Greek and Roman collections. Between September 2019 and February 2020, more than 45,000 guests visited Caravan of Gold at the Aga Khan Museum of Islamic Art and Muslim Culture in Toronto, Canada. This traveling exhibition was organized by Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University, Illinois. In the show were over 250 artworks and 100 fragments from 32 lenders. They include nine gold coins from the NS collection, of the late Roman Empire, medieval Florence and Genoa, and the 17th century Royal Guinness of England. The Society also extended through February 2023 the loan of 12th 18th century medals included in the permanent exhibition at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. Among the NS subjects are the valuable colonial period George de Sot, Indian Peace Medal, Happy Vial United, a French silver medal of Louis XV, and a group from a famous series of bronze medals of Admiral Verdon. In December 2019, a special retrospective exhibit was organized by the NS Curatorial Department to celebrate the centennial anniversary of the Saltos Award. This occasion coincided with the honor ceremony for the winner of the Saltos 2019, Mashika, who herself created a medal to mark this centennial event. Uh, now I want to introduce you to our volunteers and I would like to express our sincere and special thanks uh, to the Curatorial Department volunteers for their priceless help. We deeply appreciate great assistance of Scott Miller for his dedicated help in our medal department. We want to thank our Curatorial Associate for the United States Collection, Eric Krause, and a volunteer in turn, Jaharia Knowles. Thank you all. And in conclusion, I want very briefly mention that personally, over this fiscal year, much of my time at the NS was spent 
registering and cataloging our collections and new acquisitions, including ANS purchases and donations, and also responding to inquiries. In addition, my columns have appeared in each issue of ANS magazine, highlighting various purchases, gifts, and inter-museum loans. I also gave a presentation on the coinage of the ancient Greek cities of the northern and western Black Sea for the Society's Money Talk series. I have contributed to the ANS blog Pocket Change on assorted numismatic topics. For the academic publication, I submitted an article, Coin Hoards and Single Finds, as evidence for the monetary circulation at the Kingdom of Scythia Minor in the West Pontic region. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you all the best for the coming year. Thanks. There has been a lot going on in the medieval and modern departments, and also in the Islamic and East Asian departments. Here are a few of the highlights. We continue to receive important medieval coins from the former Archer Huntington Collection of the Hispanic Society of America. This year, Kenneth Edlow donated another large group of late medieval Castilian coins, for which we are very grateful. Other donations included some eye-catching additions to our collection of traditional African objects representing value and status from Alan Helms, as well as an assortment of contemporary items, such as two pieces representing differing views on Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, the official commemorative coin, and an anti-Brexit counterstamp. Thanks to a large anonymous donation, we have been able to begin an ambitious project of digitizing our European coins of the 16th and 17th centuries. This involves not only photographing them all, but also developing a controlled vocabulary for the large number of persons and places connected with these coins. Compared to the existing digital projects on ancient coins, this one pre presents much greater challenges due to the lack of any comprehensive numismatic literature or vocabulary covering the entire scope of the project. But at the same time, because the topic has been approached in such a fragmented way to date, the benefits of linked data offer much greater potential for transformation of the field. Last fall, we were fortunate to be able to employ Ryo Kawashima, a graduate student in history at Columbia University who is a native speaker of Japanese, as a temporary curatorial assistant for the purpose of working on our large and mostly uncatalogued collection of Japanese Hansatsu currency. During his semester of work with us, he was able to catalog and scan more than 400 of these early paper currency notes. More remains to be done, but this is a substantial improvement to the accessibility of our East Asian collection. I might note that not all digitization projects are massive and expensive. Tomlinson Fort has been making periodic small donations for the purpose of gradually getting all of our early modern Scottish coins photographed. In this way, one member with a particular interest has been able greatly to improve the online presence of a small portion of our collection. I miss the opportunity to learn from visitors about what they are studying. A few highlights from before the COVID pandemic include Christine Schaka of the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, researching Aksumite coins, Stuart Sears of Massachusetts, researching an early Islamic hoard from Yarubia in Syria, and Robert Leonard of Illinois, researching imitation Venetian ducats. Since last October, Volume 31 of the American Journal of Numismatics has been printed, and Volume 32 is almost ready for the printers. Meanwhile, Nathan Elkins and I are getting Volume 33 ready for production, featuring articles on topics ranging from Iron Age Central Europe to 19th century Liberia. I have written two articles this year relating to the organization of minting in the Visigothic Kingdom of early medieval Spain. These articles use multiple lines of evidence, such as minting technology, metrological studies, and a die study, to argue that the production of coins was less centrally controlled than has generally been assumed. And although I have not been able to go to Europe to do archaeology this year, I continue to work on publication of research from previous years. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, if virtually, and give the annual meetings presentation today. It's the first time that I'm giving it as a research curator after having served for over 20 years as a director, as you know. And this has been really a very interesting experience because suddenly I had all this free time for research and it took me quite a while to get used to this. And of course, 
this was not the easiest year to have this sort of free time and no time just to go to the library and read books. So I made myself a long list of projects and I'm beginning to work through them. Some of them deal with hordes primarily, Electrum coinage will come to this, but um, the things that I got done this year um, as articles are, as my very first project was a article on Thrace, Thrace and coinage, which my friend Ulrike Peter from the Academy in Berlin had asked me to contribute. And it was specifically Thracian identity that she was interested in, in the archaic and classical period. National identity is a very difficult topic to define, in particular when it comes to coins, but generally we're looking at culture, specific traditions, um, clothing, literature, that define the character of a nation. And almost by definition, we look for what do we have and what other peoples don't have in order to give ourselves this identity. So what, if anything, is then a Thracian identity when even Thrace as a concept is not altogether clear? This is the question I looked at. And there is a question of archeology span here, but I was actually looking at some of the coins. Um, and here I can show you a rather wonderful very large coin of this Thrace, Thrace assets. But then it's also described as Thraco, Thraco Macedonian. And the questions I'm looking at here is, how do these tribes that often have their legends on these coins, and this is how we know what their name is, and this is often the only evidence. Why do they put their name? Is this, are they identifying themselves through putting their name on a coin and why a coin? And we had these interesting cases here where also um, the word nomisma for coin is added in a very rare coin that we do not have here in the collection that I'm discussing in this article. So it's a very difficult subject and it is one in which national, modern national identity um, is also discussed through archeological objects uh, a tendency that started in the 19th century in the Romantic movement and then later on how nations defined themselves. So all these elements together obviously made a rather difficult topic, but I hope I'll achieve something. My second uh, more straightforward project was about a hoard. Um, hoards are something that I've been um, keenly interested in, published many of them, and there are many more to go, and often there are hidden as photographs, but in this particular case, um, I discovered suddenly that on loan from a private collection, um, there was a hoard in Oxford, um, which we got over to the ANS, and so we have the coins uh, here now. Uh, 66 obols of Aegina, of very early archaic hoard. And this uh, let me basically, I thought initially I would just describe these coins, but I did a die study of this early coinage of Aegina, of this obol types, which was uh, interesting. I had almost in this world the entire set of dice represented, and the number um, is relatively small. It appears that before the archaic period starts, there are only about 12 or 13 obverse dies. And the interesting thing here is the contrast to the enormous fractional coinages that we have in Asia Minor, in places like Colophon, Miletus, and otherwise, where literally hundreds of obverse dyes are known in this period. And what this basically tells us is also from a dating point of view, is that the coinage of Aegina probably starts around in the 530s, maybe a little bit earlier, but is definitely not one of the early Greek coinages that we always read about. So uh, this study has definitely led me into a very much an ANS area where many people in this place like Leslie Beer, but also Carmen Arnold, Biuki and other people had done groundwork and I hope to continue in this area. So on project number three is really one uh, in which I work in collaboration with a whole group of people um, Peter van Alphen, one of them, um, were, if you have not seen it, the tome 
um, that we produce this year. And again, just appeared before the pandemic struck. White gold, enormously heavy, better let it go. Um, and in this particular area, I have been for years with Wolfgang Fischer Bossert and uh, Desnada Pinilla working on creating a database of specimens that would allow to create a type corpus. And um, we've been very fortunate here at the American Numismatic Society to have um, a, for this year and, and going forward, Austin Andrews, who is here with me. And um, Austin, this was kind of a, a, a birth by fire, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. It's been great though, I've enjoyed it. Um, basically, I've been going through and adding to the database um, as much information as possible um, following the work of previous catalogers going through and adding information from auction catalogs, from academic publications, um, as well as from museums and other institutions with Electrum um, in their collections. Yeah, which is much larger than one would think. Initially, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's a few thousand coins um, at this point in particular with the modern material coming on the market uh, we've ways to go we are how many coins do we have at the moment there are over four thousand entered and um, more than twice of that to go <laughs> yes um, and the over four thousand in this particular project are of the earlier um, material um, that is before coin archives and, and the digital things. So um, the other one will be a little bit easier. And it's quite exciting to have this database and the ANAS has really um, um, profited from this in the past um, through just entering everything. We discovered a rather wonderful coin, um, which we discovered in, or I discovered in an Italian auction as, as being from one of the really famous old collections. So this is one of the things where these databases are also very important for provenance research, isn't it? And you've come across some interesting cases like this, isn't it? Right, yeah, when you put in all the information and you can compare all the different notes from different places, you come up with um, new information. Yeah, so this was really um, one of the projects that will be ongoing and um, We'll be working, hopefully, for at least another year on this together. Yeah, excited to see where it goes. Thank you uh, to the INS team, to all our speakers, to everybody who has been behind um, this work, behind the scene and with not speaking. Um, thank you to our fellows who could join us and to you who have been watching online. This concludes the 163rd ANS annual meeting. Um, I want to thank everyone for, th for joining us today. I hope that next year we will be able to safely gather in person once again and to provide a live stream recording as well. We'll be holding a second live stream event next month on Thursday, November 19th, 2020, when the 2020 Archer M. Huntington Award for Excellence in Numismatic Scholarship will be bestowed upon Sidney F. Martin. A press release announcement and detailed information had just been sent out. On behalf of the trustees and staff, I wish you all a happy, healthy, and prosperous year ahead. Or, in the sarcastic words of Voltaire, <laughs> the best of all possible worlds. Thank you. This concludes the agenda and I declare the 163rd NS annual meeting adjourned.